Peoples of the world, welcome back to the Dungeons and Cardboard Community Theater, where we highlight real decks played by real people over on our Discord group. And we got a good one today. We've got Wayne Yak Omega's Corona False God. It's a God Tribal deck in five colors. Uh, before we dive into the meat and bones, of course, there's the socials. You can find me on Discord at these digits. You can find both Wayne and I over on Dungeons and Cardboard, of course. Uh, link is in the description below free to join and free to play. Uh, similar in that vein is Board Game Arena, uh, where we play a lot of European style board games in a browser based application. Uh, all you need to do is create a login, send me a DM and whatever we want to play, I'll set it up and we can play. We've got games like Catan, Tigers and Euphrates, Seven Wonders and more. And of course, for TikTok shenanigans, uh, there's the links for that as well. Some extra magic content, lots of uh, music related content, uh, family shenanigans, old man yelling at clouds, rantings, that sort of thing. Alright, and Winiak Omega's Corona False God, as previously, previously mentioned, we're doing a God Tribal. So, Wooberg and one generic gives us a 5 5 legendary avatar. It doesn't say avatar here, but the card has since been eroded to be a legendary avatar. Has haste. And at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player untaps Corona Boss God and gains control of it. And then whenever this attacks, creatures of the type of your choice get plus three, plus three until end of turn. So, usually a very risky card to play. Um, mainly because we cast it, we can swing with it, but then our opponents could sacrifice it. Or maybe they're running Elf Tribal or Goblin Tribal or Vampire Tribal or Fungus Tribal, something silly. And then they just swing at us with a humongous army of... Oh, I don't know, cephalids. Just randomly, just randomly run into a cephalid deck, and all of a sudden those cephalids are legitimately scary. So, always a tricky card, um, but always a fun one to see when someone brings it to the table. And well, like I said, God Tribal. So we're just gonna dive right into the God cards in this deck, shall we? Uh, we're running a lot of the Theros gods. Uh, both from the original Theros block as well as Theros Beyond Death. Uh, the reason for this, of course, is they're not always creatures, but they're always indestructible enchantments. So uh, they're always a popular choice when we go with this theme. So we've got, of course, from the original Theros uh, block, the Athreos God of Passage. And from Theros Beyond Death, if Athreos Shroud Veiled. Child of Valara is not a god, it's an avatar. Uh, but when it dies, destroy all non-land permanents. They cannot be regenerated. Again, with most of our permanents being indestructible, not a problem. Uh, Dried of the Elysian Grove, uh, not a god, not an avatar, not indestructible. But it does help us uh, play extra lands. And it does help our lands tap for whatever color we need. Elishnorn, also not a god. Uh, but uh, the static ability is makes it powerful enough to may as well be a god. Ephara, God of the Polis, helps us with a card draw. Erebos, whenever a creature we control dies, we can pay some life to draw a card. Uh, the OG Erebos lets us pay mana and life to draw cards. Asika, God of the Tree, MDFC by the way, so on the front side we can cast the Asika. Uh, it taps our mana of any color, has Vigilance, and then all our other legendary creatures can tap for mana of any color and gain Vigilance. Alternatively, we can cast the backside of the card, the Prismatic Bridge. Uh, this we see very, very commonly in our format, where someone casts the backside, puts down the Prismatic Bridge, and then uh, from then on in, at the beginning of your upkeep, you get to flip cards from the top of your library until you hit a creature or planeswalker card. It comes onto the battlefield. Very powerful effect, very proven effect in our format. Heliod, we've got both versions of Heliod here. This one lets us uh, dump mana to make some cleric tokens. Whereas Heliod Suncrown lets us um, grant our creatures lifelink. And also whenever we gain life, uh, we get to put 1-1 counters on a creature or enchantment we control. So the cool thing about that is that we can actually put plus 1, plus 1 counters on our non-creature god enchantments. Thought that's a pretty cool synergy. Um, Ionis, God of Victory, of course, uh, making our creatures a lot harder to block, and even if they are blocked, prevent all damage that would be dealt to attacking creatures you control. 
means you can attack freely. Some of them will get through. Even the ones that don't will come home. Jorn, God of Winter. Our mana base does include some snowlands. So uh, being able to untap it and have access to more mana is always a good thing. It's also an MDFC, but um, Cauldron the Rhyme Staff, unfortunately, we don't have any real synergies with this, so we are highly unlikely to cast this side of the card. Um, Jorn is here for the front face side. Terramentra, God of Harvest, let's just go get Forest or Plains cards from our library. Karanos gives us a chance to either draw extra cards or deal out some damage to, a cre to any target, in fact. It says target creature or player. Uh, since it's been errata to be any target. Uh, Kaparthus, God of Destiny. Uh, one of the standouts co from coming out of uh, There Was Beyond Death. At the beginning of your pre garment main phase, you get to exile a card from any graveyard. If it was a land, you get to add mana. Otherwise, you gain two life and you get to deal two damage to each opponent. Our opponents constantly crack fetch lands, so we're constantly going to have mana from this. And even if we just want to do the damage, why not? Uh, it definitely progresses the game in our favor. Kalvori, God of Kinship. Uh, the front face side says as long as you control three award legendary creatures, this gets plus four, plus two in Vigilance. So a 6-6 six, six Vigilant Beater is always a good thing to have. Uh, two mana tap, look at the top six cards of your library, maybe reveal a legendary creature and put them into your hand. Yes please, being able to get that card advantage. Uh, MDFC, so we could cast it on the backside, which is the Ring Heart Crest. It'd be, it's essentially a 2-mana mana rock that could only be used to cast spells of the type of your choice, or a legendary creature spell. So, good flexibility on that card. Moving on to Crufix. Uh, this lets us carry over our, all our cards, because we have no maximum hand size. And also we can carry over any mana that we, uh, we don't spend. Yes, that mana becomes colorless, but we can save it from phase to phase and turn to turn. Bogus, um, asking our opponents if they want to sacrifice creatures or just eat some damage. Uh, Nylea gives our creatures trample and gives us a chance to buff those creatures. Uh, the Theros Beyond Death, Nylea, keen -eyed. It says creature spells you cast cost one less. Um, yes, please. That's exactly what we want to be doing. And also, if you pay three banner, reveal the top card of our library. And if it's a creature, it comes to our hand. Otherwise, we have the option of putting it into our graveyard. A catch for the true. Helps us create some warriors. It's always going to be a creature. It's always indestructible, but it won't always have the opportunity to attack or block. We do need to have at least three other creatures on the battlefield. But we'll get there, no question. Uh, Firika, God of Affliction, lets us exile cards from uh, graveyards, and if we exile a creature card from an opponent from any graveyard, um, its owner will get a 1-1 black and green stake enchantment token with death touch. So we can exile our own creatures in concept and uh, with her in a spot. But mainly, uh, it's exiling creature cards from opponent's graveyard, so they lose access to it, and we don't care about the 1-1 death touch creatures. Our gods are mostly indestructible. Phoenix, God of Deception, gives us a chance to mail out some players if someone is, you know, digging through their deck a little too aggressively. Ah, uh, Perforos, whenever a creature comes onto the battlefield under our control, we get to deal 2 damage to each of our opponents. Thassa Deep Dwelling is here. Let's us exile a creature we control at the beginning of our end step. It comes right back onto the battlefield, and then we get all of the relevant triggers. Uh, Thassa, God of the Sea, is also here. Gives us a scry at the beginning of our upkeep, which is a great thing to have. And also has a mana ability that lets our creatures become unblockable. The Scarab God. At the beginning of our upkeep, each opponent loses X life, and we scry X, where X is the number of zombies we control. Now, most of our other creatures, of course, are not zombies, but this can help create zombies for us, uh, just using that activated ability. And uh, we do have one other card in the deck that helps create zombies. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, Xenagos, God of Rebels, is our last creature in the deck. As long as our devotion to red and green is less than seven, it's not a creature, of course. But if we have combat on your turn, another target creature who we control gets haste and plus X plus X, X being that creature's power. So this really lets us go on offense, especially if we're going to be swinging with our commander. 
uh, some enchantments um, a little bit of spice not just the gods but we're also running sanctums so we're actually running all five, all of the sanctums and we're running all of the hundens we're not running the Goshen ties uh, I guess because they're too easily swept up but the hundens and the sanctums are all here if you're not familiar the hunden is a cycle of enchantments with the shrine subtype that will give us some powerful triggers at the beginning of our upkeep being able to gain life deal damage force discards draw some extra cards we're also running the maelstrom nexus by the way which says the first spell we play each turn has cascade so it should make it a little bit easier for us to cast our hundens or our sanctums the Sanctums uh, work a little differently from the Hondans in that they only trigger at the beginning of our main phase. So the beginning of our first main phase is that's when we get these triggers. But it grants us things like mana. Uh, we've got two of them with activated abilities, of course. So Sanctum of Shattered Heights says if we discard a land or a shrine card, we get to deal X damage to a creature or a planeswalker, X being the number of shrines we control. And the White Sanctum... Um, it says six to tap target creature, but it costs one less to activate for each shrine we control. If we get four, if we get five shrines out there, itself included, then it's white to tap target creature. One other permanent to talk about here that is a planeswalker. Calyx, Destiny's Hand. Uh, for four mana, uh, some great abilities here that synergizes with the deck. Uh, plus one to look at our top four cards. You get to reveal an enchantment card and put them into our hand. Or minus three to exile a creature or enchantment we do not control until target enchantment we control leaves the battlefield. Our gods being indestructible. Uh, makes them more of a target to any exile-based removal that they could be suspect to. Uh, but our, but that does, that's depending on our opponents actually running exile-based enchantment removal. There's not a lot of it out there. Uh, minus seven, return all enchantments from our graveyard to the battlefield. If we get, if we're allowed to get there, then it's lights out. Seriously. Uh, artifacts, just six, including the assault suit, which is uh, specifically here for Corona. Throw this on Corona, makes it so that the, she can no longer be sacrificed, and is no longer able to attack us. We could be commander damaged out by our own commander in this deck. That is one thing we have to be very careful of when we run a Corona deck. Commander's Plate. Equip creature gets plus three, plus three, and has protection from each color that's not in your color's commander uh, color identity. So unfortunately, that means we don't get any protections from it. It's just a nice way to make Corona or whatever other creature we equip significantly larger. Gilded Lotus. Taps for a bunch of mana of any one color. Helm of the Gods. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one for each enchantment we control. Uh, Nev's Disc. Um... Pay one tap and uh, destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. Uh, most of our indestructible gods, of course, survive this. And Ratchet Bomb, which comes into play no counters. We can tap and put a charge counter on this. Or we can tap, sacrifice this to destroy each non land permanent with a mana value equal to the number of counters on Ratchet Bomb. Going to instants and sorceries, not a lot here. Um, just three instants, only a couple pieces of removal. We've got Beast Within and Chaos Warp. Also a two, uh, an instant speed tutor with Eladami's Call lets us go get any creature card and put it into our hand. Our Sorceries, Eerie Ultimatum. If we manage to fill up our graveyard, return any number of permanent cards with different names from your graveyard to the battlefield. Pretty sweet. Idyllic Tutor lets us go get any enchantment card, put it into our hand. Kamal's Druidic Vow. This is something we want to dump a bunch of mana into. Green, green, and X. Look at the top X cards of our library. We may put any number of land or legendary permanent cards with mana value X or less among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest into your graveyard. Note that we must be controlling a legendary creature or a planeswalker in order to cast this. Being a legendary sorcery, that is a restriction we have to be careful for. On to Inversion. Destroy all non-land permanents. Eight mana is a lot, but we'll get there in this deck. And again, our gods are indestructible. They're not going to be affected by this. Of course, if we draw this way too early and have no real hope of casting it on the front side, we can always uh, 
play it on its backside as a land. Shatter the Sky says each player who controls a creature of power 4 or greater draws a card, then destroy all creatures. Sure thing. Um, we, have, we have gods. Those gods are often power 4 or greater once they're creatures. We get to draw a card and not lose anything on our side, really. Supreme Verdict destroys all creatures, cannot be countered. And Time Wipe says we get to return a creature we control to its owner's hand, then destroy all creatures. And that did not take long at all to go through uh, the Corona False God Tribal Deck. I do have a couple of uh, Yari flavor ideas here, if I may share. Um, a little surprised that we're not running Ghost and Tie of Life's Origin. I'm not saying run all of the Ghost and Ties, but we have enough enchantment uh, synergies going on here that this would be a good fit. Uh, not only do we meet the color requirements for the activated ability, um, it synergizes with the shrines that are in the deck, but even any gods that somehow end up in our graveyard, this can bring back. So I thought this would be a spicy piece for consideration. Uh, a couple of enchantments I'm a little surprised not to see would be any of the Enchantress's Presence, because this lets us draw cards. And the Greater Oromancy to even further protect our enchantments, and uh, especially our gods. Because once our gods become creatures, uh, they become targetable by things like Swords to Plowshares. Uh, greater Oromancy prevents that from happening. And we're not targeting our gods with any of our abilities, with the exception of, I think, Heliod, the one that, uh, that grants lifelink. And one spell I want us to suggest here, Devastating Mastery. It's a spell I've only cast one time so far. Um, it's a five color deck, so white, 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 and two is a very unreasonable cost to pay. But look at the student cost, where we get to pay white, white, and two. Uh, by paying that cost, yes, one of our opponents gets to bring two of their cards back to their hand. That's fine because it's still taking all non-land permanents off the battlefield. So that is why I think this is a fantastic card. The one time I've cast it, believe me, it made a big difference. Um, I'd only made up to, I only made four land drops up to that point in the game, whereas everybody else had ramped out throughout some big creatures, so kaboom. Devastating is definitely the word. And also, not necessarily a deck suggestion, but more of a story, if I may share. Um, this wasn't Wayne's deck. It was someone else playing uh, Chrono False God, and I was running Thantis the Warweaver, and I had Ruins of Deus in my hand. And so, when Corona got to me, I chose Violence. I enchanted Corona with the, with the Ruins of the Deus. It's red, got Double Strike. It's green, it got Trample. Um, the game ended very, very quickly after that. No, I didn't win the game. But when I chose to enchant Runes of the Day as to Corona, I had already chosen not to win that game. I chose Violence. So, just a fun story I wanted to toss out there. And I would, on that, I would like to thank you all for watching. So, be sure to come subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what we're doing here. I've also got a couple more videos, including my own deck techs and other community theater decks on the right-hand side. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and we will see you again next time. Bye for now.